Good afternoon and welcome to Town Meeting Television. It's our favorite time of the year. It's Town Meeting 2021. And today we are having a look at Burlington ballot question number six, authorizing retail cannabis sales. Shall the city of Burlington permit the operation of cannabis retailers that are licensed by the state of Vermont beginning in October, 2022? And um, we have gotten uh, a request to talk about this from the con standpoint. Dr. Catherine Antley is very well known to us here at Town Meeting Television. She produces a series of programs on prevention and the benefits or the non-benefits of um, marijuana. And she is the leader of Physicians, Families and Friends for a Better Vermont. Welcome Dr. Catherine Antley. Thank you. And Jim Dumont is a lawyer Dr. with Catherine that, Antley with that well coalition. Here at Town Meeting Good afternoon. And Mariah Flynn Sanderson is the director of the Burlington Partnership for Healthy Communities. Welcome, Mariah. So glad you could be with us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Jim, why don't you give us the legal view on uh, your opinion about whether Burlington voters should support ballot item number six, authorizing retail cannabis sales? The basic message is not yet. It's too soon. Let me tell you why. Marijuana sales have only recently been legalized in a few other states. The medical evidence and the effects of marijuana sales in those states is just now beginning to come in. There's a lot we're learning. We know the Surgeon General of the United States has issued a warning that marijuana use during pregnancy can harm the developing fetus, including harm to the fetal brain, and that smoking or eating marijuana with higher levels of THC causes increased incidence of anxiety, paranoia, and psychosis among adults. But there's a lot we don't know because legalization is so new. Unfortunately, the new Vermont law has a major glitch in it. Under that new Vermont law, once a community votes yes, and a marijuana retailer sets up shop, that retailer can continue to sell marijuana in your community forever. So let me explain that. That means that if the community finds this was a bad decision because of the public health effects in that city or town, or because of medical evidence from other states, the community can vote to change its mind, but not for any retailer already in business. Under the new statute, the community is locked in forever to that marijuana retailer. If the marijuana retailer breaks the law in any way, that would be different. But so long as the marijuana retailer follows the law, even if the town or city votes to repeal its approval of marijuana sales, that retailer can sell marijuana in your city or town forever. The legislature, the legislature needs to change the statute. Uh, we've written to the governor, we've written to leaders of both houses, asking them to make that change. Until that happens, voters should be cautious about committing their communities to marijuana sales in perpetuity. So can I just ask uh, just a couple of follow-up questions? Um, do cities, does the city of Burlington have to, to make a zoning change in order to permit, I mean, in terms of the follow-up to this, does the city have to create some permitted areas for these op these people to operate, cannabis retailers, or no? No, I just was looking at the Burlington zoning a few minutes ago. Um, marijuana sales would be considered retail. And so it's already permitted by local zoning. That doesn't mean the zoning should stay the way it is. That's another reason it would make sense to wait. Um, in my view, as a land use attorney, has done a lot of zoning cases, probably too many zoning cases, um, you should have the zoning in place first before people set up shop. Because if you don't want, if you want marijuana sales, but you don't want them in certain locations, you've got to decide that before people get their license from the state and set up shop. Because once they set up shop in a location the city says is not a good idea, it's too late. The horses are out of the barn, you can't force them to move. And then my, my second question has to do with this perpetual uh, condition that your, re, that your license, is it that your state license could go on forever? There's no end to it. And is that the same thing as uh, 
say uh, retailers who sell liquor in the state of Vermont? Is that is is that where they took the language from? Uh, um, it's a great question. I'm pretty sure that language is unique to this statute. This statute is long, complicated, and unique in many ways. And I, I've never seen anything before which says the town votes to or city votes to approve of a certain use and then they change their mind people continue that use forever so you mentioned zoning in zoning that's not true in zoning there's grandfathering but under state law grandfathering is not forever grandfathering means under our state law unlike other states but in vermont if you're a grandfathered or grandmother use you can continue but not indefinitely the city or town has the right to force you to phase out your use. But okay. that is not true under the new statute. Thank you. Dr. Catherine Antley, I know you have some very deep and uh, informed views on this question. Please tell us if you would support or oppose this ballot question. Number I think it's three. important for Vermonters to know, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and I clear. Think I think it's important for Vermonters to know that their pediatrician, their child's pediatrician, would advise them to vote no on this ballot question. And there are a couple of reasons for that. A number of medical societies also um, in the United States have you know, passed resolutions in the same, saying the same thing um, or, or similar um, from a similar standpoint. And I think um, there, are, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one, one thing before we delve into the medical side of it, though, um, getting back to sort of the specifics of the law. Um, so the law also says, this Vermont law, that first, first people in line are going to be the medical marijuana shops. And the medical marijuana shops are uh, vertically oriented, integrated rather, which is, um, makes them um, more likely to be able to be monopolistic and control the uh, market. And so, and, the, and in Vermont, I think it's important for Vermonters and Burlingtonians to know that those shops right now, the majority of those shops, in other words, I just heard four out of six are owned by large, very large um, uh, out of state companies. So that sort of sets you up for a situation where a large out of state for-profit corporation would be moving in and possibly could move into Burlington and, and, and set up shops that then we, we, we're out of control. We could never um, bring them back again. So there are a number of reasons why we couldn't bring them back. One is the law, which says they're in perpetuity. But the other problem is, you know, there's, there's right and then there's might. And, and if they have unlimited funds to fight in court, that's also a problem. And these are huge, huge corporations. Well, why, you know, why does that matter? Marijuana is an addictive substance. We all know that. Marijuana is harmful. We all know that. We heard the Surgeon General's warning. It's associated with problems during pregnancy, but also psychosis, uh, anxiety, um, so, uh, all, um, poor concentration, IQ. It, it, there, there are lots of harmful issues associated with marijuana use. So what happens when it's commercialized? When it's commercialized, these companies are interested in creating addiction. And we've talked about this so often on this, on this, on this channel, but uh, they do not make $1 of profit unless they create addiction in your community. How do they create addiction in their, that, then the reason for that is, is that 80% of the product or more, and we're see what we're seeing in, in the uh, marijuana sector of, of the economy is that, even more than 80% um, of the product is consumed by less than 20% of the consumers, of the users. So the, the bottom line is that we're seeing over and over again is they don't make $1 of profit, not $1 of profit until they are able to create addiction. How do they create addiction? Well, we know completely how we, they create addiction. They get them while they're young. They appeal to children with sugary candies, the, the gummy bears and whatnot. Um, and then the other thing they do is they, they produce really concentrated THC. So we saw this, you know, we saw this with the um, candy cigarettes, with the uh, taking tobacco and spraying it with freebase nicotine. 
we have extremely high concentrations of THC that are getting in the hands of the children. I have, we have a website that we set up to put some of these articles, these articles up uh, for people to look on their own, but there are a couple of new ones that have just come out. One says that in the commercialized states, um, kids are getting, are getting this high potency THC more, much more than kids in non-commercialized non states. And they're getting it even more than their parents. So it's uh, so they're getting it illegally because nowhere is it legal for kids to get it, even in, in commercialized states. And they're getting the super high concentrated stuff, which is particularly dangerous for the psychosis, anxiety, depression, suicidality, all the really scary mental health issues that we're seeing, you know, more of anyway. The other thing that there's another study that came out that goes along with that, that shows that the more marijuana shops in your neighborhood, the more likely your child is to use and to become addicted. So the perception of harm goes down um, and availability is there. So they, they're, more likely, they're more likely to use. The last study I wanted to talk about um, is the one out of Ireland. So in Ireland, a few years ago, they closed the shops. They closed head shops. And the admission rate for psychosis um, into the ERs, marijuana associated psychosis went down by 20%. So, so that's a really clear study. If we, if we allow shops in Burlington, these are out of state shops. They're gonna have a lot of money to advertise in the newspapers to, And what we've seen in other um, places where they've tried to put limits on advertising is they, they, they publish their own magazines. So it's gonna, they're gonna wanna sell their product and the way they're gonna do it is to, cre is to increase addiction. Um, so, so I just wanted to be really clear um, that the messaging is, is, has not been very good in Vermont. Um, you know, we've, the medical community, some psych child psychiatrists have called um, healthcare reporters in our area explain to them that there's risks of anxiety, suicidality, um, mental illness, and this is really settled science, you know, coming. And um, they, you know, we're not, we're not seeing those reported when uh, in the newspaper. And it's, it's outrageous, it's really outrageous because people are not, that creates this huge gap between what, what, what the science is and what people's perception of harm of this drug is. Um, the last thing that I just, well, there's two other things, I guess one is, there's a poll that was done in Vermont about a year ago, and it gave the Vermonters four questions, four choices, medical marijuana, legal, illegal, and as it is, in other words, commercial or as it is, only 30% of Vermonters said they wanted pot shops. And um, so, so it's not, you know, something inevitable. And a lot of people, if you talk to them, they're, they're not, they're not interested in having a commercial giving corporate personhood to a corporation that's out of state uh, that has this monopolistic organization um, and that now somehow has gotten written into the law that they're gonna be first in line. And if they get a license, they won't be able to be pushed out. I have a lot more to say, <laughs> but maybe um, you know I, we can put up the website and people can. Yeah, I think we'll put up the website and um, why don't we let Mariah um, chime in, and then if we have a little time, we could wrap up with you again, doctor. Thank you. Mariah Flint Sanderson of Burlington Partnership for Healthy Communities. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, I run the Substance Misuse Prevention Coalition that serves Burlington. So our org I'm here representing the organization and the partners that are involved in that, and we are taking a position on the ballot item in specifically but one of the things that's kind of my job is to do what Kath, uh, Dr. Antley was talking about, which is the science around cannabis and marijuana at this point has come a long way. We know a lot more than we did even when I started this job about 10 years ago, um, or I started 13 years ago, but about in the last 10 years, we've learned a lot of information, but the public understanding of this substance hasn't really caught up with the science and the research yet. So my job is to help people um, to lessen that gap and to help it be more understandable so that people in Burlington kind of know what they're voting on, understand. I think one of the challenges 
that I see with even just the ballot item is using the word cannabis. A lot of people still don't really know what that means. What's the difference between cannabis and marijuana? What's CBD? What are all these words we keep throwing around? It's very confusing. When I talk with my community members here in Burlington, people are still just don't, and they, when we ask, you know, are you for um, retail cannabis? They think we already have that because they make the, they confuse it with CBD. So I think that's the challenge as a community to understand what it is that you're voting on. And if you don't feel like you have a clear understanding, then maybe now is not the right time. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I kind of wanted to hone in again on that Dr. Antley was talking about and that um, Mr. Dumont kind of alluded to is this idea that um, there's still so much about this law that's very confusing. Um, and I think will get worked out in Vermont in the courts, or um, I think there's just, at this point, we don't, communities don't really know what they're voting on when they're voting for this. Um, and one of the things that we talk about a lot in my work is what can local communities do with policy to help protect health, help support a healthy, vibrant community. Um, I, we, I think we all want that. We all want a healthy community. We all want it be easy for people to make healthy choices. And large corporations for whom um, addiction is their bottom line for where they're trying to get people to use substances, they tend to focus on vulnerable populations or disadvantaged communities or youth um, because that's where they make the most profit. And so as a community, we need to think about how are we protecting our youth? How are we protecting our poor lower income areas, which right now have the, most of our tobacco retailers are in our poor areas of Burlington. They're close to the schools. Um, so these are things to think about. Do we need to do some additional work around policy to ensure that we're creating a space that can help everybody thrive? Thank you, Mariah. Dr. Antley, you have a minute closing comment. Would you like to use that up? Let's have your mute. Unmute yourself. Yeah, the, uh, the classic <laughs> of the pandemic age. I'm Sorry about that. Um, yeah, just I just I think it's important to reiterate that physicians are concerned. Uh, pe your pediatrician uh, would advise you. Your child's pediatrician would advise you to vote no to pot shops in your town or in your neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I think we didn't touch on the fact that there's people do say that this is going to regulate it. We haven't seen regulation work in any any uh, town or rather any uh, state where it's been. In Oregon, only 3% of the material that's on for sale in the shops has been inspected. And um, there was a study not too long ago in Denver, 70 some percent of the marijuana there had mold in it. Even in Vermont, our medical marijuana had a scandal where they discovered a lot of mold and the employees were not allowed to talk about it. Um, and in that article, which was in the digger, they uh, found an authority who said, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the of the marijuana that's sold has has mold in it. So this is the black market hasn't gone away. I just saw a statistic where, you know, 60 percent of the, of the marijuana in in uh, California, a significant percentage is still um, sold in the black market. Um, you, the it, it, we've we've seen Colorado has seen a jump in organized crime from 31 cases to 119 cases between 2012 and 2017. You know the organized crime is dangerous. It's very powerful. Vermont is little, and we don't have you know the the wherewithal to fight to fight these or to 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 keep all these um, issues in line. So I think it's you know I would urge a no vote. It's I think it's it's clear anybody who's concerned about their community about the vulnerable sectors of the community, about their own children, now is the time to, to vote no. Thank you very much. Dr. Kath Catherine Antley, who is um, the leader of Physicians, Families and Friends for Better Vermont, Jim Dumont, who is a, uh, an Esquire, a legal advisor to that group, and Mariah Flynn Sanderson of the Burlington Partnership for Healthy Communities. Thank you so much. We've been talking about Burlington ballot question number six, authorizing retail cannabis sales, which is also on the ballot in Winooski and in Richmond in our viewing area. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And thanks for watching Town Meeting, Town Meeting Television. It is going to be an election day on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. So don't forget to vote.